Chief Engineer Rob Davis welcoming you to Airship 27 Productions podcast number 18. I'm here with my co-host and commanding officer of Airship 27. Hi everyone, Captain Ron Fortier here and away we go getting ready to to record what we call the fastest hour on the internet. Uh, But before before we get to all that good stuff and we do have uh, quite a bit on the agenda today Rob. uh, Let's you know, get through the the thanking our sponsors. We want we are proud members of the Comics Podcast Network. You can find us on comicspodcast.com every single month. And I don't know, Rob, if you've ever checked out that website, but I did, and I'm I'm very impressed with uh, comicspodcast.com. Uh, okay, man, they have a lot Jump of different. There. Po- yeah, I mean, on every topic and subject you can think of all, you know, surrounding uh, the world of comics and science fiction, movies, et cetera. So it's like that one-stop place. If, you'll, if, if you've got a specific interest or a hobby and you'd like to find what podcasts are available on the Internet, uh, head over to comicspodcast.com. You'll be glad you did. Wow. Okay. I, I wasn't aware of all that. I, I, don't, I don't listen to that many podcasts, so it's... I don't I don't have time. I'm too busy putting books together. <laughs> <laughs> well, right, but you know, and we we know this for a fact. A lot of our artist friends who yeah. they're working late at night either listen to music or a lot of them like to listen to podcasts while they're working. Yeah, I, I found that's too much of a distraction for me. But right, it's it's pretty much it's pretty much like talk radio in its in and of its own yeah. right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, again, I usually if I'm going to listen to anything, it's usually. Uh, Music without lyrics to it, so I'm yep. not, you know, yes. I'm not mentally distracted. You do the exact same thing I do when I write, because exactly that. If 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 I'm hearing lyrics, it's going to gum up the creative mm-hmm. process in my own head, what I want to write for dialogue or whatever. Absolutely, yep. I've got it's either a classical radio station or it's uh, soundtracks. And I know yep. you listen to a lot of soundtracks. Yeah, I do. I yeah, I, I'll pick out the ones that. Uh, the atmosphere of the mood suits what I'm writing, and then away we go. Uh, yep. the, the, the joke about this is when I first started, uh, the first novel I ever wrote uh, with uh, the late Arnett Mayer uh, was a fantasy adventure called Tale of the Seahawks. And to get into that mood, I was in my office, and this was the, this was before CDs and, and you know playing them on the Internet. And I was trying to look through my long playing albums to find out – you know, which of, of the albums, the soundtracks I had that would get me in an action adventure mood. And sure enough, Rob, I had the John Williams soundtrack to the first Indiana Jones movie, Raiders of oh, Lost Ark. Well, I started playing that. And of course, it worked like a charm. All right. I mean, it literally, I, but I, it would, the album would end and I'd go over and I'd start it again. <laughs> so of course, for over a month, all Valerie, the poor dear, heard all the time with on 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 and she, it got to the point where she hates that music. <laughs> no so doubt. I'm yeah. gonna finish that stupid book, so I don't have to listen to that music anymore. <laughs> oh my God, funny thing. Headphones. She should have bought yeah. you headphones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I do have, and I'm actually wearing right now. So. Yeah, yeah, she did that a long time ago. She 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 figured that one out. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hey, let's let's get to the uh, to the agenda. Yeah. I'll, I'll let you uh, lead off with uh, you oh, know. Let's, I, yeah, let's talk Pulp Fest. Please. 2016. Uh, it was another great show. Uh, it's always great to meet our uh, old and new and make new uh, friends and fans. Uh, we, and we sold sold out of several new titles that we, and. As the show was going on, I mean, on, on Saturday already morning, Saturday morning, I was already telling Ron, we should have brought more of this. But how do you know? You don't know. So oh, we okay. sold all 15 copies of the Holmes and Houdini special, and we sold 
Did we sell the last one of those? That was on Saturday morning, wasn't it, Ron? Or yeah, those, those, yeah. yeah, those went on Saturday morning. Uh, well, Saturday or Friday? I don't those know. I think, no, I think we had one on Friday. Friday. No, those were gone Friday. That's right. They all went on Friday. They were first, gone. First day of the con, before lunch, right. all 15 copies were gone. And obviously, you know, uh, we'd gotten the word out uh, on the Internet uh, that it would be a special edition. And, boy, people came over to the table the minute we, we opened up. And those those kinds of things are fascinating, right, Rob? I mean, because you, <laughs> signed, you signed them all and numbered them. Uh, yeah. Our good friend Mark Allegra uh, was back at the show this year, which was really great to see him again. It's been a while since he's attended uh, Pulp Fest. And he came over immediately. Those are the ones, those are the ones with your cover, blah, blah, blah. He goes, I want number one. I want number one. And then... <laughs> <laughs> which, which I, haven't even, I haven't even signed and numbered anything yet. No, we, we so. haven't finished unpacking. No. So, <laughs> so the kicker with all that is uh, there was one guy who came up, and I think we had two or three copies left, right? Yeah. And he, and he looked through them, and then he went, oh, this is number 15? And you said, yeah, right, I numbered them, you know, 1 to 15. So I, there was 14 and 13 still left. And he goes, oh, I'll take this one. It's the last one. <laughs> so he bought it because it was number 15. Okay. And I'm like, and that's fine. Yeah. Whatever. But but they're gone. <laughs> and look, uh, again, you know, let, let's reiterate for all our loyal airmen who are listening to the show. Uh, rest assured, okay, uh, I've spoken with Chad Hodden. and Chad's wicked, wicked busy with the Harlequin comic book for DC. But he's still on board to do the cover for the uh, actual book. And as soon as we get that cover back from him, uh, or from him originally as it is, Rob will put the entire package together. We'll get it off at Amazon, and everybody will be able to get a copy of Holmes and Houdini. I'll just slide it in there. Yep. There you go. Uh, and, you know, I do want to mention uh, the books that do, that we kicked ourselves for that sold out, I think, deserve, <laughs> deserve a nod. Uh, one was, of course, Towers of Metropolis. Yeah, I was stunned. Yeah, because we had at least five copies. I mean, yeah, when we had four or five, I don't remember now exactly how many, yeah. but it wasn't a lot. But it wasn't it wasn't enough, right? I mean, because because these shows aren't again, you know, these aren't comic shows, and usually we do bring three to four new titles since you know Windy City or whatever when we right. arrive at, at Columbus. So, you know, we have to be judicious in, in what we pick, what we can afford from the inventory and whatever. And Towers and Metropolis have been selling online, which was what the thing was. So we figured, okay, well, we'll bring five copies to the show. And, God, they disappeared on us. Uh, and then, even then, we had what? Uh, you and I had debated whether to bring any copies of the giant Legends of New Pulp Fiction. Yeah, which, we brought, and we brought two. Right, because it's now been on sale for over half a year. Yeah, and we we didn't, sold, yeah, we've sold tons of them online. We sold ten of them at Windy City, so it was a case of, well, you know, maybe most mo most of our you know regular you know most pulp fans out there should have a copy of this. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> they were waiting for us to come to Pulp Fest with it. We had only two copies, and again, those were gone in a heartbeat. So yep, they were gone. Boom. Yeah. I get, we're going to have to, you know, I, spe specifically with Legends of New Pulp Fiction, until until for sure, I think I think it's going to be a wise bet to have at least four or five copies with us at every convention from now on. Yeah, I'm I'm reluctant because it's so darn big. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and it, it just, you know, it's one more thing to, to box up, but you know that's it, that people are wanting it. Uh oh, I'm going to have to bring it along. So yeah, four or five, I think, probably be. For, at least for the next convention or two. Yeah. Right. right. Okay, so why don't you pick up where I, I jumped in here? Oh, okay. Well, let's see if I can find my place here again. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, we sold all 15 copies of the Holmes and Houdini special. Uh, we met Mark Justice's wife, Norma Kay. His widow, actually, is the, per is the, is the proper way to say that, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a wonderful experience for both of us. Mark Justice's The Dead Sheriff is now in production with Art Cooper doing the interiors, and Zach Bruner, the cover. Uh, the year of the pulp women, <laughs> this show was. Lori Powers won the Muncie Award, and Barbara Doran, 
I'm, I guess I'm pronouncing that correct. I, I never have asked her how to pronounce her name. Becomes right. a the first woman, first female to sit on Ron's new pulp panel. Hooray for her! Yeah, I, I was I was thrilled. I really was. Uh, you know, having you know, there are a lot of, of uh, uh, women who attend Pulp Fest, and having Barbara along as a writer, never mind just an attendee, but an yeah. actual cr- creator. All right, participating in the show. Was was the first, and you know I know she listens to the podcast. So Barbara, congratulations! Uh, I, I'm tickled pink that that you know you won that position in in New Pope history. All right, and uh, hopefully we're going to see more women joining the fray. Yeah, and it struck me that she was kind of nervous about the whole thing, and I just kind of I she she fully deserves to be on that panel with everyone else, and I. I hope that this has kind of broken the ice for her and she finds out it's not that bad. You just get up there and talk about what you get up there and you talk about what you know. Right. I mean, how can you, it, how can you lose? You, you, you're talking oh, oh, about stuff that you know very well. Oh, oh, she was excellent, Rob. And I mean, and, and as, as all these panels have been in the past, uh, Barbara was, was surrounded by, uh, both old pros and, and new right like, colleagues like herself. Cause uh-huh. we had, Joining her on that panel was was our old friend Wynn Scott Eckerd, yeah, who's been at this game as long as you and I have. Oh yeah, he's he's a pro at, he's a pro at, at panels, Absolutely. right? And he has his own publishing house, okay, uh, and is involved with uh, the late Philip Jose Farmer's estate. Ingrid Davy Hardy's birthday. <laughs> what the heck? That was an announcement telling me tomorrow is Ingrid's birthday <laughs> <laughs> on my computer. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Ingrid Hardy, by the way, is is one of the regular uh, artists here at Airship 27. So Rob's got that all taken care of, apparently. Yeah, I, I, know to, I know to let her know, to, know tomorrow. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then to, to wrap up the panel, the new pulp panel thing, uh, we also had Andy Fix and Jeff Fournier, uh, which was their first time on that particular panel. So all in all, it was a really great hour, Rob, of talking about new pulp fiction, how to how people write it, how they approach it, edit it, and all those kind of things. And uh, again, we had a nice uh, audience in attendance, and it, it's just fun. Uh, I'm, I'm it's, it's wild because I, I no sooner got out of moderating this year's show that by the time I got back to our our, our tables up at, at the the main room of the convention. Uh, I pretty much already got three people uh, scheduled <laughs> for next year's uh, panel. Yeah, yeah uh, you, they were. Yeah, they were just tagging right along with you, or you were you're tapping them to be on next year's panel. Well, it, I, it, was, it was almost it was it was by volunteers because one right. of the things. Well, I say volunteers. I recruit people and volunteer them. You know what I mean. <laughs> So the old army size is not us, you know? Yeah, right. Yeah. Hey, Rob, we're going to do this. Okay. Well, like, say no now. (laughs) One of the the things we want to mention is that uh, in Towers of Metropolis, uh, it was the first uh, time that we published a uh, piece of fiction written by a father and son team. Yeah. And that that was our old friend Bill Maynard and his high school age son, uh, Mike. Who right. was at the show? So yeah. uh, you know, I wasted no time in talking to Mike, and hopefully, uh, we will be talking in the future about him contributing uh, other stories to Airship Twenty Seven for a yeah. young man. He's following in his, his father's footsteps. He's in the yeah. And if Mike, if Mike is listening, hey, that was a killer hat, man. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. He, he had yes, a great hat. he did. <laughs> uh, so, so going along with that, I. I I nipped Dak real quick and basically asked him if he'd like to sit on the panel next year. Because, Great. again, we had a woman this year. Uh, I want to bring in that new blood. Okay, what's more new than a, a, a writer who's still in high school? I think he's getting ready to go into his senior year. And then uh, our old old friend at Airship 27, one of our dearest friends at the conventions, Rob, uh, John Bruning, just yep. published his er- first ever Pulp, a new pulp uh, adventure novel called The Midnight Guardian, Hour of Darkness, uh, which I'm currently uh, in the process of reading and enjoying immensely. And so seeing John was now a published writer, 
I nabbed him. He hasn't done a panel yet. And finally, the last of the three I've, I've nailed so far was a, a gentleman we're going to talk a lot about uh, as this show goes on. And that's our friend from uh, Windy City, Fred Adams Jr. Well, is he coming to Pulp Fest next year? Uh, he, for- well, he will make an effort because he was there this year, which, you know, he said he would be. So he showed up that uh, Saturday. He, right. he okay. came for one day, brought a, a friend of his, another colleague. And in the course of our talking, I turned around and said, you know, you know, I'd love to get you on that new pulp panel here, Fred. You haven't done that yet. So fingers crossed. Fred's his stuff. And yeah. he's, he's, an, it, it, he's an excellent addition to any panel. I've had him on a couple of different panels, and he's, a, he's always apologizing for, uh, you know, excuse me for just a second. And I'm going, no, run with it. <laughs> Oh, go oh, I mean, right. Fred knows his stuff. He's yeah. he's very he, he's a former uh, college, college professor. professor. I mean, gosh, right. he, taught, he taught English composition. Right. So you can imagine when I get his manuscripts, Rob, they are, <laughs> they are a joy to read. I mean, literally, if 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 I find a typo or two, that's that's my editing job with Fred. Okay, <laughs> it's it's that easy. I just sit back and enjoy it. All right, so why don't you wrap it up? Because I'm going to let you finish. Uh, th- this uh, agenda topic. On Pulp Fest 2016. Yes, uh, and here's here's a really fun note that we can make is that fan Nick Sauer, S-A-U-E-R, I guess that's how you pronounce it. I don't that's know right. for sure. Yeah. He was yeah. there because his wife had given him a visit to, the, to Pulp Fest as a birthday gift. <laughs> I, have never, I have never seen a guy with a bigger grin on his face. He was like a kid in a candy shop running around the place looking at stuff and figuring out what he could spend his money on, you know, how to spend his money. He was – it was amazing to watch him. He, like I said, his his grin was from ear to ear, just oh. having the ball. I and was, his I wife was, was having yeah. a ball watching him. Yeah, so, I, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was so taken when he came over to our table, right, and I saw his name tag. And, you know, I've known Nick on Facebook for quite quite a while now. And I mean, he he couldn't contain himself, right, Rob? He was like no, jumping was, up and down. I'm yeah. here. I'm here. I'm at Pulp Fest. So then we're, <laughs> we're like looking at him, going, "Okay." And he goes, "My wife gave it to me as a birthday gift, and his birthday was months ago, you know." But she <laughs> yeah. kept it hidden. She got the, I guess, the travel arrangements. She got tickets to the show, and that's what she gave him for his birthday gift. She gave him a pulp convention. So wow, happy birthday, Nick. That was that was. <laughs> <laughs> and, and nice going, Nick's wife. I, yes. I get her, didn't get her name, so I'm sorry I can't use her name. But my goodness, what a what a great thing! I mean, and he was. There, there's no other way to put it. He was a kid in a candy shop. Just, oh yeah, yeah, just crazy. Yeah, so, yeah. that that was that was so much fun for us. We had a ball. That was crazy. And yeah. so yeah, so there you go. That was uh, Pulp Fest uh, 2016, as Rob said. Uh, one of the interesting notes, and then we're going to move on. Uh, one of the real interesting notes happened, I guess, Saturday night at the annual business meeting. All right. Yes. Sometimes we go to those, but this one we decided not to go. So right, so and we heard that's... about Sunday morning from our friends who had attended. Well, apparently, uh, there's been some issues with the hotel venue in Columbus, <laughs> and this is like the second you know place they've gone in Columbus. So apparently, the committees having issues with finding a, a good, solid venue. And now, apparently, they're getting some kind of, you know, hassling from the hotel and the convention center itself. So <laughs> it was brought up during the business meeting about the possibilities of moving the convention next year to another city. And that happened to be Indianapolis, which Rob and I would be overwhelmingly happy about. Well, yeah, they'd make a, it, it would chop three hours off of my trip, and Ron flies into Indianapolis anyway, so because it's a little cheaper than flying to Columbus, and I pick him up and drive him on into uh, to Columbus, so that would that would shorten uh, the trip for both of us. Ron, if we that would eliminate the uh, the visit that Ron and I have for three hours on the way, but but uh, we we would gladly give that up to have the the convention be a few hours closer. 
No, well, it, that's it. Rob, Rob yeah. gets home earlier. I get home. I don't have to rush to the airport like all I right. do you know, when we leave yeah. from Columbus because we have to drive all the way to Indy for me to catch my plane. All those kind of things. And, you know, Rob, you made a point, which I kind of hope, you know, again, all our Pulp fans listening to this, hey, have no no you know qualms about writing Jack Colors or Mike Chomko or the other members of Pulp Fest, um, you know, managing committee. And, and giving them your thoughts and opinions, okay? Because they do take them into consideration. But yeah. one of the things Ron had said when we talked about this, uh, you know, leaving the convention to drive to Indianapolis that day, was the fact that aside from everything else, what they would immediately do is bring the con to maybe a, a huge new audience. Because you have to figure, you know, Columbus isn't all that far from Indianapolis. It's what, a three-hour drive for us, Rob? Yeah, it's about three hours. A little, two hours and 40 minutes. Right. Uh, so Matt so says. I, w- I would hazard to guess that we're moved to Indianapolis. Maybe 90% of the regular attendees in Columbus would just, you know, they'd leave earlier or make other arrangements. Right. But they would still go to Pulp Fest. But here's sure. the thing. Not, not only would you regulars coming back, you'd have an entire new metropolis of possible fans and attendees in Indianapolis. Right. So, exactly. To me, that's that's a win-win. We will see. We will, we will see what they will do. Okay, I, I'm sure they're going to have the winner to talk about it, and I, and I, I would hazard uh, they won't go far beyond uh, the end of the year because they'll have to make arrangements yeah. with hotels and whatever. But right. uh, hope, hopefully, it's a done deal. But this is, but this is a, we, we like the idea, and I think it would be a plus plus for them by, you know, it's not that far from Columbus, yet it's a whole new, it's a new city, might have some new, new fans to bring in, plus the old ones wouldn't have that much further to go. Not really. I yep. mean, we, you know, most of the folks that come to the uh, Windy City, they're driving, you know, at least as far. So right. you know, th- three, four, five hours. So yeah, and yeah. we're we're coming in. I'm coming in from like six hours away. So yeah, it's it wouldn't be that much. I wouldn't think. I, I would I, like. I'd be thrilled well, to death. It'd be me too, both of us. We'll see what happens. I'm, I'm sure Mike and everybody else will keep us posted online uh, if if and when any decisions, concrete decisions, I mean, because they're going to have to anyways. Ultimately, they'll start promoting the next year's show. You know. So yeah. Okay. All right, hey, yeah. look, let's move on here. Move on. We, yeah. we, we got to get to what's new, what what's, what just came out of Airship 27, and what's coming out shortly thereafter, hopefully. Uh, I'm going to take the top one, Rob, and I'll let you have the second. Okay. Uh, right. Released last week was Hit Wolf number 2, The Pack. And this is Fred Adams' thrilling sequel to his first book, about a Green Beret in the 1970s turned into a werewolf by a New Jersey mob. In book two, our hero recruits his old team from Vietnam, and they too become werewolves. Lots of great action in this one. Clayton Hinkle is once again on board doing the interior illustrations, and we got a dynamite cover from Zach Bruner, uh, which he turned in. It, it's it's, it's mind bogglingly beautiful. Zach Bruner. It, yep. And so that was released last week, uh, and, and believe me, if you want to talk about a one-two punch, Hit Wolf, uh, the first Hit Wolf was one of my favorite books of all last year, and getting to do the sequel, believe me, folks, Fred doesn't, doesn't ever slack up on the quality of his work. Hit Wolf 2 is a brilliant sequel. And you know what? I want to throw in this little real quick thing uh, that Fred told us, Rob, uh, when he came up to our table at Pulp Fest. Uh, he was at a book signing recently, and on the table were, you know, several of the books he's done for us here at Airship 27, including Hit Wolf. And a gentleman literally walked up to him, pointed at Hit Wolf, and asked him, has this been optioned for film yet? <laughs> at, which, at, at which point Fred said, uh, no, and the gentleman gave him a card and said he'd be in touch with him, Rob. And oh suppo- yes, uh, supposedly he's involved with a production company. There you go. Wow, just the just the cover and the and the concept, right? 
Oh. He got it immediately. The, the first cover was, of course, by Ingrid Hardy, who has a birthday tomorrow. And <laughs> right. <laughs> and basically, it's it's the gunman and a, a werewolf leaping off the cover. And the guy right. saw the title and the cover you know, details very much the plot of what you're going to get in the book. And that was it. He liked it enough to leave Fred his card and say he would be in touch. So, you know, hey, uh, like, like we keep saying, uh, the movie people are finding Airship 27. Wow, that's great. Oh, fingers crossed. <laughs> fingers crossed. All right. What, what, Very what, cool. what actually came out today, Rob? Today came out uh, Rick Lies Major Sabat. Sabat. I, it's spelled Sabbath. S-A-B-P-A-T-H. But it, right. everyone seems to want to pronounce that Sabat. So that, right. make, that make, kind of makes some sense. But any, anyway, this is a tribute anthology to the spaghetti westerns of actor Lee Van Cleef. It was proposed by Rick Lye, and it features stories by Rick, Frank Schildiner, and Eric Franklin. Michael Dean Jackson provided the wonderful interior illustrations and the ever-amazing Pet Karabjal. I always hope I pronounced that correctly, but we'll see. Uh, did up the truly beautiful cover. Uh, and has it has a very lengthy essay by uh, uh, Rick Lye in the back of it about Van Cleef's uh, career in those Italian westerns. It also includes some uh, some stuff about the characters that are that are in the book that are kind of based on some of the characters in the movies. Right. So it's it, and that finishes up that book. Uh, it, it brings it up to it's over two, slightly over two hundred pages long. Yeah. So it's, it's and I didn't bump the price up, although I, you know. It, uh, it will cut into our royalties just a little bit, mm-hmm. but uh, mm-hmm. because because of the, the the size of this book, it's right on the edge here. So you're still going to get that if you get it at Amazon. It's sixteen ninety nine, and right. as always at conventions, it's fifteen dollars, and that's a bargain for this particular book, especially if you like the kind of essays that uh, Rick has, has outlined in the back of this. If you're a fan of Lee Van Cleef, this is really uh, interesting information about his. Uh, is being in these in these pictures where he played this particular bounty hunter type character. Yeah, so uh, you know this book's only been out now. Uh, you know, by the time people listen to this, a couple days. But Frank emailed me. Frank Schildine emailed me and said he looked at the Amazon numbers uh, later this afternoon, Rob. And apparently, we're getting all kinds of sales right off the bat. Yeah, I I, I was on there earlier to, to uh, one of the one of the writers, uh, Eric. Eric Franklin had ordered some copies of the book, so you know I popped in the Create Space and saw that it, that's it's uh, it's the number one seller this month. I mean the month is only what a week old, yeah. but it's it's already the number one seller for this month at this point. There's another <laughs> one, you know, right behind it, but uh, I think it was I can't remember whether it was the Persona or was another book, but anyway, wow, uh, yeah, it's right it's right up there. Yep, that's amazing. I it, it, yeah, that, it's crazy. That, <laughs> well, you know, hey, look, uh, for all you guys listening who bought copies and are going to buy copies, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have yeah. the we have the most loyal fans in the world out there, buddy. We really do. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Uh, we'll put up a new book, and within uh, you know, as soon as you get the word out, man, we're starting to sell copies. So, yeah, th- thanks a lot to, to all the folks that uh, that are just following along with, with us, and uh, we're gonna work our behinds off to, to keep putting out the kind of books you guys like to like to read. So just hang in there. We're And uh, we're going to get on to the, the, to the list of potential possible next books. <laughs> okay. So, right. Let me ex- – excellent segue, Rob. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With two books out in two weeks, can we get three books out in three weeks? There, think, there exists a possibility here. Yes. Uh, and if that's the case, that – that third book is going to be uh, Dead Man's Melody. It's a Most great like new, it. yep, yep. It's it's a great new murder mystery by who else but Fred Adams Jr. And Rob, you know what? This is actually the first novel Fred ever wrote. Oh wow! Okay. All right. The the story behind this is we had met Fred several years ago in Chicago, and mm-hmm. he introduced himself to us and basically afterwards uh, wrote me and I sent him our submission guidelines, et cetera, et cetera. And he started writing books for us and doing series. 
Uh, we've got the Six Gun Terra series. We've got the uh, what we just talked about, the Hit Wolf series. We've got the C.O. Jones series. All right, there's a second that's one of those right. coming. He's very prolific for us. I mean, several yeah. things going on, a bunch of stuff. So we go back to Chicago, right? And he comes over to me uh, at the following year, or whatever, and he goes, "He says I saw in your uh, your submission guidelines that you don't you don't like first person." Uh, narrative submissions. So I looked at him and I said, well, you know what, Fred? It's it's really primarily because I have found in my own reading experiences, Rob, that a lot of writers don't do that at, at well at all. Uh, first person obviously means you, you have to you have to get the voice of a, a fictional character. And, you know, we deal with that with Sherlock Holmes, where our writers are Watson. But, right. but I... The rest of the stuff that I've, I've had submitted to me over the years, Rob, is, is catcher's catch can. Okay, some of it is okay. Other of it, other of it is is atrocious. It's cliche ridden, and and you know you could tell somebody's trying to act like somebody else in writing for his person. So eschewing that and going back to the original pulps, the majority of which were in third person narrative, that that's our you know our primary requisite for submitting to Airship Twenty Seven. Well. Fred and I having a discussion, and I looked at him, and I said, so what's the point of, of this this topic, Fred? He said, well, you know, he says, the first book I ever wrote was a mystery novel, a straight-up mystery novel, but I wrote it in first person. Well, Rob, now after editing two or three of his books and knowing <laughs> what a writer he is, I turned around and said, you know what? Every rule needs an exception. I said, Fred, please, send me the manuscript. At least let me read it. So sure enough, we got back. That, that year from Chicago, and within days, I had a copy of Dead Man's Melody. It blew me away, Rob. I, it, it's easily the best thing he's done. Uh, yeah, that's saying a lot. Uh, let me give you a little. Let me, it, it's basically the story of a former rock and roll star uh, who, just prior to the band he belonged to hitting the big time, his bandmates kicked him off the band. So now it's 15 years later, and he's gotten by with playing, you know, small nightclub one gigs or whatever, teaching music at local schools and whatever, and he's put the past behind him. Until one morning he wakes up and he listens to the radio, and the singer who had basically kicked him off the band was found murdered, shot to death. And lo and behold... The police come knocking on his door. The character's name is Sam Dunn. And the police think that he's holding a 15-year grudge, and suddenly he's a person of interest. Yeah. So Okay. So as much as he tries to convince everybody that's foolish that he put that all behind him, cops are cops. And they keep bugging him and until eventually Dunn realizes the only person who can clear his name is he himself. And he starts investigating on his own. Rob, it's 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 a it's a phenomenal, great mystery written like the stuff that you that you and I would have read uh, in the paperbacks back in the sixties. Right. Yep. Okay. And he pl- he it's, plays. It's, fi- yeah. It's set in the seventies. I kind of yep. got you know I, I'm always talking about how you know I don't read our books, yep. but every once in a while I'll pick one up and I, when I'm putting it together. I'll get a phrase or two will catch my eye and I'll find myself uh, you know, three, three or four pages later going, wait, I'm not reading this. I'm just putting it together. Uh, there's sections in this book that dragged me in just, just little glances of, of uh, phrases in his, in this book really well, grabbed me. And, I right. ended that's, see, bravo. and that's what he does. And that's why Fred does for his person brilliantly, like all the classic mystery writers. Okay. Because he becomes done in the book and his his twist and choice of words is almost poetic my friend uh i have so much fun and and so here we go we finally uh found a, an interior artist in a gentleman named richard john who was sent to us by my old green hornet pal uh jeff butler uh-huh. and you Sweet. are going to be you are going to be handling the cover and even as you and i are speaking right now uh, another part of the Airship 27 family is proofreader Gordon Demowski, who's yep. proofreading it. So with fingers crossed, uh, sometimes in another week, seven days or whatever, uh, 
Fred's first ever novel, Dead Man's Melody, will be hitting uh, Amazon. And I am I am psyched. I am delighted and thrilled by this. And the last thing I'm going to throw out about all that, Rob, is that uh, he just sent me a new Sam Dunn book. So <laughs> we have a sequel in the works. <clears throat> Yeah, and, and on the cover itself, it says a Sam Dunn mystery. Yep. So, yeah. It, it, so, yeah, I figured it was going to be a series <laughs> from that. So I made sure that was on the cover, was in the was in the, uh, the logo. Okay. So we'll, hopefully we can do some little carryover in the imagery somehow to make, make sure people see that, that, that it's the same same series that, that the first one is. We'll see how that goes. All right. It'll be a, ch- a challenge to your design skills, my friend. Yeah. Yeah, I get those every once in a while. So, <laughs> all right. I, so, so, what, so what's it? What's, what's a good bet for after Dead Man's Melody? Um, well, it could be. I know we've had most of the pieces of this next one, the Phantom Detective, uh, all because I know all the stories are in. Uh, and artist Andrew Ritchie is is still working on the interior illustrations. So, um, and Pat Karabjal. Uh, he says that he's he should have the cover to us by the end of the month. So that that might be the one after uh, after uh, Dead Man's Melody. So yep. we might actually we might actually have four. Well, it might not. It'd be four books in five weeks, maybe. Yeah, with with some luck. Yep. yep. You know, for a year that started slow, it's picking up pace. Well, it, you know, it does this. There there are just pockets of of uh, it's feast or famine, as I always call it. Uh, the first of this year was feet was famine. Yeah. Uh, then we kind of hit a, a small feast, and now we're hitting a big feast. So you know, it, it just happens that way, it, and it's completely unpredictable. It, it, I say this every every one of these podcasts. We make all these plans. We say, okay, this book's going to be next, but then stuff doesn't. You know, we don't get artists. Artists have a problem of some sort. You know, something happens with their family, or they get sick, or they injure their hand, or you know, something happens. And they can't finish up what they're doing, or the, or another job comes along that's going to pay them uh, uh, money. So, and and they've got to take the money paying gigs. Ours is a backdoor deal, and 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 you're not going to make a lot of money doing covers for us. But it's so darn much fun. That, <laughs> that's why we get so many people to work with us because it's it is fun doing these pulp covers. Right. But we never know what's going to happen next. Okay, so, so look, let, let, let me pick up on that thread, all right? Because again, you, you know, we we do want to include this every time we do a new a new show, uh, because if you, if you saw the queue that Rob and I, you know, keep pace with and, and line, uh, new books are coming in every single week, uh, every single month. I mean, in the last uh, two weeks, Rob. I, I've literally gotten in four novel submissions and, two, and and three short stories. So you know, there's there's no lack of material. Now, you know, a good topic that I want to just cover in a second, and I'll jump into all this other stuff. Uh, several of our colleagues and competitors uh, have found themselves in a similar situation of being flooded with submissions, and have gone to the point of saying, okay, well, you know what, we're going to have a moratorium. So. Every now and then, I'll have people say to me, well, you, will you guys ever do that? And my answer is, not really. I don't ever want to shut that door. But no. what but what I've done now, though, and, and because in all fairness, uh, when a new writer comes to us and says, or even an artist that says, hey, you know, I'd really like to work with Airship 27 Productions. The first thing I tell them, Rob, in all honesty is, well, make sure you have a great deal of patience. Because... Again, and I tell them about the randomness of how these books come together. And because they're a back-end deal and because nobody gets rich working for us, we don't pressure people and we don't give them deadlines. As books get assembled, they go into the production queue and they get put out. If it takes a while for a story to come in to fill a book, then that's what's going to happen. If it takes a while for an artist to turn in interior illustrations, that's what's going to happen. Well, I mean, literally... We've had books, Rob, that have gone as long as four years before they were completed and put out. So, again, my caveat to new creators who want to work with us is, hey, you know, if you have the talent and and the quality of work, we definitely want you to be a part of the Airship 27 family. But please understand, we do the best we can. We're a two-man operation, and it may – 
the average, I would say, is between two and three years from the time you submit something to us and we actually get it out. Now, of course, as, as everything else, sometimes we can get a book out within a couple months. And, and I'm thinking of Bass Reeves last year, Rob. Right. Yeah, that was one. Uh, of course, the, the Legends book, that book, that, that, that didn't take two years. Right. Uh, so, right. And look how big that thing was. Yeah. And then, and then there's Sinbad. That's another yep. one that came together seemingly, seemingly overnight. You, you pitched the idea out there, and, and just almost instantly we had submission. We had a, we had a book, That's right. Crazy. So, book right, so we can't like guess. So, again, I just want all our creators out there to be aware. It's not because we ever push anything back. We don't do that. We, we work our butts off day in, day out, week in, week out, year in, year out to get these books out as, as quickly and efficiently as we can. But there are going to be times when that's impossible. So if you have the patience and the talent, come knocking on our door, and we're more than willing to say welcome. So, yeah, and part of, that, part of that, too, is that, it, again, like Ron mentioned it's a two-man operation. You know, Ron reads all the scripts and, you know, and kind of edits them and, gets, and helps those folks who need a little bit of help getting their, their scripts together. And then when it gets handed off to me, I'm the one-man production office. I, mm -hmm. I'm it. I do the logos. I do the layout of the book. I choose the fonts, you know. So, and there's only so fast. It, I can only work so fast. I've right. got a method down where I can get it done pretty quickly. I've got lots of templates to use, but I still have to do, a, sometimes I have to do a lot of really little tedious work on each book, and it takes a while. So, you know, it, they, I can only get them out so fast. Uh, if they start falling together like recently, though, uh, uh, this will be one a week, and that's that's pretty that's pretty darn. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's amazing. That's nothing yeah. short of amazing. That just it, you know, it's just it's just the way things fell together. I mean, sometimes it's you know, I've I've had it assembled for a while, but we're still waiting for pieces. Yeah. So like like art pieces to to, to kind of push in there, yeah. and there's a couple of them that way. So one one a week. I mean. Our average over the last three years has been what two books a month? Yeah, you know, approximately two. Yeah, yep, exactly. So get three, and this month we might have four. So yeah. it just that would that would kind of break a record. I think it, this three and three weeks, three books is I think is a record for us. It, it is. Yeah. We've yeah. Gotten, yeah, we we we've we've averaged. I say in the last four years, five years, we've averaged between twenty twenty and twenty four books a year. Yep. That's where we fall into. So, hey, look, getting into that, here, here's what Rob and I have pushing up behind us all the oh, time. Yeah. Okay? And I'm, trust me, folks, this is a handful only. All right. It's nowhere near all the books that we have uh, coming down the line. After after almost three years, I mean, I personally just finished writing uh, the fifth Captain Hazard novel. It's called Custer's Ghost. And it co-stars Jim Anthony, Super Detective. Uh, and Rob will do, be doing the nine illustrations for that. But then uh, I still have to find a cover artist for that book. I had a gentleman in mind and contacted him last week. Unfortunately, my timing was off, Rob, and he's got some very heavy paying jobs. Uh, and so just could not fit it into a schedule. So I'm once again on the hunt for someone to paint the cover for Custer's Ghost. Uh, and then on your plate, aside from that, <laughs> there's there's the latest Mystery Men and Women, Volume 5, which which arguably I think is the oldest book that we have sitting in the queue, which is why we wanted to, to push yeah, that one along. That's next on my uh, agenda is to do right. the illustrations for that. Right. At the same time, again, I'll be looking for a cover artist. Then we have a brand new Sherlock Holmes full-length novel called The Picture of Innocence by our good friend Chuck Miller, Chuck being one of the most original writers uh, to ever put pen to paper. Uh, then we have uh, the, the novelization of a comic book that Rob worked on many years ago with writer R.A. Jones, Simidar. I've already read and edited that book. It's phenomenal. It will be an adult's only book, and, and we'll talk more about that when it gets closer to production. But once again, Rob is going to be working on the interiors for that, and Ted Hammond hopefully will be our cover artist. 
Let's not forget <laughs> the second Jezebel Johnson Pirate Queen adventure from our dear friend Nancy Hansen. The first one was a joy for us to produce. Yeah, Both Bob and I had a ball, right? Me reading it, Rob doing the illustrations, which he will once again do. And with fingers crossed, Rob, I'm going to go after Terry Pavlet to do the second cover as well uh, yeah. to give us some uniformity. And then... <laughs> There's still another Sherlock Holmes consulting detective, this one being Volume 9. And so, that, so that's we, one, two, three, four, five, six in my queue. That's <laughs> right. In other words, if you were listening, those are all those are all titles that Rob does the interior illustrations for. So again, uh, hey, this is a good time to ask for artists, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Please, we want, we always welcome new interior illustrators all yeah. the time. Okay, I mean, all, the, all of these books are ones that that I I'm, I'm not going to assign to anybody else anyway. These right. are ones that I want to illustrate, but they just happen to all bunch up together here. And that, again, it's feast or famine, so I'm in a feast. I mean, right. well, yeah, and 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 being as fair as we could be, again, like we talk, uh, Mystery Men and Women Volume Five is the oldest collection of stories so these these writers have waited long enough and uh once rob wraps up dead man's melody that will be his project on his you know priority table so hang in there uh one of the things we like to do on the podcast and we're going to get to it right now because uh the hour is a quick as of as ever flying past us at, at light speed uh and that's the uh where are we at with the Brother Bones movie? And you want to read that, Rob? Okay. Now, for the latest on the Brother Bones movie. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Two weeks ago, writer-director Eric Franklin finished the actual shooting script, and Ron gave it thumbs up. With everyone in agreement, Eric and his partner have begun scouting locations and doing some rough storyboards. I, Rob Davis, have been doing sketches of the principal characters, so there's a seventh item on my list of yep. uh, principal characters in the story to help with the casting and the costuming. I've got another one on my table right now that I'll be getting on late, a little after we get finished recording here. I'm going to go do another one. At the same time, Ron has begun writing a graphic novel adaptation of that script. A well-known comic company has expressed interest in in publishing it, and we'll let you know more when things are official. Hush, hush. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Mum's the word. Okay. Right. Meanwhile, we did sell several copies of the promotional movie posters I did up for the Pulp Fest, for Pulp Fest, and we still have some left. They are $15 each, which includes shipping and handling, and you can order them via our Airship 27 webpage using the PayPal Buy Now button. I've got that set up so that it'll inventory them, and it gives me a notification and, and an address and everything to send these to. I've got a little, I've got envelopes to put them in, and, and it, it, they'll all go out pretty quickly. But you'll have to go to that web page, uh, airship27hanger.com, and uh, that will take you to our, our regular catalog page. You'll have a, and then you can order your uh, your poster. It's right at the top of the page, so you can go there. Hit that buy now button, pay it off at PayPal, and I'll be winging your your uh, signed poster. I'm signing all of them. Uh, excellent, excellent, Rob. Great. Send it out to you as soon as I can get to the post office and get the postage, and it's usually the next day after I receive the order. So, and it usually takes uh, it from what it says, it's three or four days for it to arrive. So, you could order it on a one day, and five days later, you got your poster. So there you go. I, you know, I, I got to tell you, I, I love the way that poster came out, Rob. Uh, and, you know, we, we were signing them together at Pulp Fest. Uh, I know of two people uh, who ordered them and are, are thrilled uh, they, they've received them. One was Teresa Bain, right. uh, mm-hmm. Glenn Bain's wife, the people who are doing the Brother Bones uh, role playing game. And she's having it uh, matted and put up in their <laughs> office. Yeah, and, that's right. Our, our good friend Michael Housel, who wrote the Persona, yeah, uh, got his copy uh, I guess yesterday in the mail, and and was thrilled. He, he wrote a big uh, blog on his own on his own blog page about Brother Bones and and the poster and and uh, the what the audio book uh, the, which was just released by uh, 
radio archives of the second yeah. book, the Roman Leary book, uh, Six Days of the Dragon. So, you know, people are, are, are getting on the Brother Bones uh, bandwagon. I, I couldn't be happier. And just to add to what you read, okay, um, I got a letter from Daniel last week in this whole process. So I'm just going to read exactly what Daniel wrote me uh, so fans will get an idea of how much work uh, Daniel Husser and Eric Franklin are doing. And he goes, uh, we are in the process of breaking down the script and figuring out what we need to raise funds for. We have a cast and prop breakdown finished, and I'm moving on to set dressing and starting a potential shooting schedule. We oh. have found... We have found several potential locations for the gridiron bar. Ooh, cool. Yeah, the abandoned warehouse, Topper Wiles Mansion, the Bordello interiors, mm-hmm. Tommy Tommy's room, and Father O'Malley's office and church. We will be talking with them. I gather the people who own these properties uh, soon and looking for more places. Also, we have a line. This is this is great, Rob. We have a line on a great era car for Bobby to drive in. Bobby <laughs> being Bobby Crandall, Brother Bones' uh, assistant. So apparently they've got a vintage car, Roadster, that they're looking at to get for the film. Um, unbelievable. So then oh. it, it, it continues, my friend. In addition, we will be starting visual effects tests. Of one, the ghost. Two, big Swedes burning. <laughs> so, that sounds bad enough. That's that is that's not as appealing as a cookout as you might think. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, three, the twin effects, which is going to be wild because whoever the actor uh, who gets that role is going to be playing the twin brothers. That's going to be great. That's you know a challenge in itself. That is- Real acting challenge, but because you're acting against yourself. Yep. Usually, yep. usually, at, at, just for folks, because I've done a little bit. I did a little bit of this when I was in college, at, at, and did I did a little bit of film work. It, it's what you've got is you're you're acting you're you're acting both parts, and when you're acting one character, someone else is off stage, reading the lines for the other for your other half. So you're not really even acting against yourself. You're acting against somebody reading the script. So you've really got to have your mind in it and yep. do it right. It's tough. Okay. And so finally, the last couple things uh, that will require special effects will be uh, the ether, where Tommy meets his spirit guide. And Ooh. ultimately, yeah, and ultimately Tommy's ghost in that warehouse scene, uh, which I know you're familiar with because you've read the stories doing the illustrations. Uh, he ends it with saying, Daniel and I are looking forward to beginning to see to these projects next week, which is the week we're in right now, Rob. Oh, and cool. we are, yeah, and we are excited to see uh, more of Rob's excellent character sketches uh, and sign Eric Franklin, one of the co-producers and owners of Franklin Hustler Entertainment. So there you go. Uh, while at Pulp Fest, Rob uh, brought the two-minute video uh, <laughs> teaser that the guys had made. He yeah. pulled it out on his laptop and started playing it for our friends at the convention. And believe me, within minutes, we had a large crowd hanging <laughs> around the airship 27. T- and what, what was the reaction, Rob? They were stunned. It, it, everybody was stunned at how, how good it looked. And once we told them that was done in a weekend, they we really got stunned uh, responses. Yep. So, yeah, everyone was everyone was uh, thrilled. I mean, you know, Round of applause, I think, is probably the best way to say it. They all, they all really liked it. We're generating a buzz, my friend. We really are. And uh, hopefully uh, Daniel and Eric both plan on sharing uh, images with us as well, Rob. Uh, we'll, we'll hopefully get to see uh, some of the early storyboards and some of the location photography they'll be shooting. And as, as we can, we will share those with our friends on Facebook. Yep. Okay. Hey, we got a question. We got a question from our good pal. Just have time to answer it. <laughs> yes, our good buddy Gordon Demowski. Why don't you read it, Rob, and we'll get okay. into that. All right. Here's the question. Are there any public domain characters that you haven't published or about to publish that you and Rob would love to create on anthologies or stories around? 
Uh, there's no need to name specifically if there are plans afoot. A simple yes or no will do. Also, I hope recording goes smoothly and you don't have two unplanned rehearsals before that big show, like <laughs> we did last time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but for so those of you, know, for those of you, I, I hope people actually got to listen to episode seventeen because boy, it it took blood, sweat, and tears for us to get it out, didn't it? Yeah. Oh my gosh, three three times through that. But anyway, it, 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 third time's the charm. But anyway, he wants to know which which public domain characters that we haven't published or are about to publish that you that the the two of us would love to see uh, some anthologies on. And I, I haven't really given any thought to this, to be honest. <laughs> Anything you've got? Yes. Uh, look, uh, I, I, I want to thank Gordon because Gordon, Gordon understands this whole publishing thing. He's a writer himself, and and one of our our writers and a proofreader. Uh, in, in parentheses, he does say there's no need to name specifically if there are plans afoot. And so, right, I cannot name this character. What I will do is say this. All right. Uh, there, there was an old radio character, uh, a hero character from the golden days of Radio Rob, where they had the Shadow and the Whisperer and G Men and all that stuff. Right? There was a there was a really really popular radio program with a hero character. All right, uh, that was around for quite a few years. In fact. Uh, in his uh, autobiography, Stan Lee mentions the fact that this particular character uh, was a great inspiration to him as a teenager listening to it on the radio and was responsible for him creating uh, one specific Marvel comic character. Well, okay. over the years, I've heard radio uh, broadcasts that you can find on YouTube or whatever from this character. And I was recently talking with our good friend at Moonstone, Joe Gentile. Well, you and I have done a book for Joe uh, called Faces of Fear, in which the black bat teams up with the purple scar. Well, Joe is so happy with that particular novella, which should be out, I think, Robin, maybe another month in the most. Yeah, I think, All right? that's, yeah, I think that's right. Well, while at Windy City this year, Joe and I got to talking, right? And Joe said, would you and Rob consider doing another one of those? And I said, I'm pretty sure we can fit it into our schedule later, you know, the start of next year. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not this year, but the next year. Oh, and so, so I says, are we, are we talking novella and, you know, Rob's illustrations, the pencil stuff? And he goes, definitely. And he turned around and told me this. He says, I'd love for it to feature the Black Bat and Domino Lady, all right? And I went, okay. And he goes, remember that character that you like so much on radio, Ron? And I went, I sure do. He says, could we incorporate that character in the story as well? So it's basically going to be a story with three pulp heroes and the premiere of this classic radio character in print and prose for the first time ever. So to answer your question, Gordon, yeah, we're, we're still finding such great public domain characters out there. Stay tuned. We'll give you more information as time as we're allowed to. Cool. And that's it. The hour is done. Uh, it's zip by as, as ever. And oh, I, yeah, uh, look, one last time, thanks to everybody at Pulp Fest who showed up, uh, and, and especially one of, one of Airship 27's loyal fan, a gentleman named Ken who walked away with almost half our inventory the day he came. <laughs> and, I, and Rob knows I, I ain't kidding. Oh, my uh, God. Uh, yeah, and I was so I was so happy that he found that many of our books. I, I gave him one of those uh, Brother Bones posters as a, as a, a, a thank you. Uh, right, as a, right. I mean, I, I, nobody has ever bought as many books from us at one time as Ken did. So, Ken, I'm sorry I don't remember your last name. But you are one of our, our best, best fans. You know fans who you are, Ken. <laughs> yeah. God bless you, sir, okay? And God That's bless Jack Cullors, Mike Chomko, Ed Hulse, all the guys who put on Pulp Fest, uh, and Rob and Nick I. And Sauer's wife. That's it. Very happy man. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's it. We got to get out of town and let Sparky Brant follow, put this all together. Hopefully it'll be out by the end of the week. Once again, Loyal Airmen, thanks so much for listening. Rob, say goodnight. Good night, everybody, and Ron. 
down ship. This has been a Gonzo Goose production. Bonk!